All right guys, welcome back to part number three of our Kirdashi build project. Now this is a really, really easy project. I know a lot of you guys have, have yours done already, which is really cool. Uh, for those of you who are just joining, I'll explain the steps that we've gone through quickly. And again, this is a super, super quick project. We definitely don't need to take all this time, but we're just doing a slow build along for those that may not have, uh, you know, even four or five hours straight to, to work on a knife like this. This is something you could do with just a couple hours a week and you get one of these things done in a month, no problem at all. So the steps that we've done to get to this point right here here was we annealed a file and that is a steel that we're using for this was just a file and to anneal it you want to get it really really warm to its critical temperature uh, you can use a magnet to see if it's no longer magnetic and that's how you know you're very much at uh, critical temperature and then you want to cool it as slowly as possible and to do that I used perlite I stuck it in perlite and it worked really really well this was very malleable workable we cut the profile out with a hacksaw and then we cleaned it all up with another file to get our profile all nice and cleaned up so the next step of this project is we need to put a bevel on here now traditionally, if I understand correctly, I believe Kiridashis were a single-sided bevel and that means just one side has the, the bevel ground into it and that's what I'm going to do for this one and you want to kind of, if you're going to do a single bevel, you want to kind of plan whether you're left-handed or right-handed, me being right-handed and the intent of this knife, I'm going to be using this as a leather cutting knife so I want to keep this side right here flat and I'm going to put my bevel here and that actually makes it really easy if you're, say you're cutting along rulers or something like that, this flat side really follows that quite nicely and then you get that cut that blade is right tight to uh, the ruler that you're cutting it at so to get the bevel on here we're going to build a very simple very bush league beveling jig I just need to cut up some wood uh, this is gonna be the base of it this is just a piece of treated lumber I'm going to make a stack of lumber up this high and then I've got this piece of aluminum you could use whatever you want this round tubing works and essentially we're just gonna clamp our file to this so that that end will rest up on some blocks we'll We'll stick some blocks two by fours up on that end to build up to our angle that we'd like. And then we will clamp our Kiridashi right here. And basically that angle will be consistent then and we can just start filing in our bevel. All right, now we're going to attach the file. Now we'll just clamp the file to the board here and align it right up with the edge there. Just a couple of clamps to hold this thing down. like that we're putting in our bevel starting out with an angle of about 17 degrees I'm not sure if that's quite right uh, I can always adjust it a bit uh, so I've got all these blocks what do I have one two three four five six seven two by fours and that's giving me an angle of 17 degrees that should work pretty good we can always take some blocks away or add some blocks if you want and then you see we did put in these uh, two screws here just to keep this top part whoops keep that top part from coming off but really, that is as simple as a hand beveling jig can be. Now you can make this a lot more complicated. Uh, I've made them in the past that are adjustable, so I actually used an eye bolt, uh, a 3 8 eye bolt, and so I could move it up and down depending on what I was working on. But just for the sake of this little demonstration, really, that's a beveling jig right there. Doesn't get much more simple, more basic, and more bush league than this. All right, I'm gonna pull up a chair, get comfy. See what we can do. So we're nice and thin there. 
don't want to go too far. And then the other thing we need to address is the texture on the back on this side. And to do that, I'm going to kind of lower this down just about like that. And so we'll file just that little tiny bit, or we could also deal with that in the sharpening stage. But okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put a little piece of sandpaper on here and just clean this up a little bit before heat treat. Now you see our edge is starting to get these bumps and that is due to the texture on the other side of the blade. So I'm actually going to come with a file, just kind of take this down a little bit and then we're going to call this good enough. See we've established a pretty nice bevel in there. All right, we'll hit this just slightly with a file and then we'll be ready to harden this thing up. Alright guys, so we've got our blade roughed out, we've profiled it. Uh, we took that file just on the edge there just to get rid of those little tiny impressions. And that is one of the downsides, I guess, if you're using a, uh, a file. Uh, to make this is that you've got this texturing. Also, had I thought about this a little bit more uh, before I'd started, I would have put um, the side that wasn't beveled, I would have made that the finer tooth side of the file because with this being a coarser tooth, the peaks and valleys in this texturing are bigger. And so we've got slightly more discrepancy in our edge there and the bigger grooves and stuff. So that would have been one thing I've done next time had I thought about it, but oh well. Um, that's the one thing I guess when you're using a file is that you're going to have that and you will have have to put a slight bit of a bevel on this side um, or you could leave it a little bit too and it'd be more like a uh, saw type cutting motion but I'd like this to be a fairly decent slicer so we'll, we'll take that down a little bit further as well when we're doing the sharpening. So let's get some oil and I'm going to try the old torch method again of heating this up. I'm not sure why I just kind of feel like it. I want to see if we can get this super duper hot just with the uh, just with these small propane torches. So. hardening just the tip, just basically this bevel. That's the only part I'm really looking to get nice and hot, is just the bevel. I should really have safety glass on when I'm doing this. Stand by. Uh, I can see the cutting edge is already getting really nice and red there. Also, I'm not sure if this is going to work. I've never tried a hamon before. But when I go to quench it, I'm only going to put about half of the bevel in the oil, maybe a little more. I want to see if I can get a hamon line in there. I'm not sure if it'll work or not, but this is all just for fun anyway. So you see, we're already got a, we've already got a really nice color there. Hopefully it's showing up on camera all right. But this is definitely working well. All right, ready? Well, we will see if this worked. Now we'll go ahead and stick the whole thing in there. I don't know, I'm not sure if we got a moan or not. I'm not even sure if it's hard. I've got a notion it's hard though. Uh, the oil that I'm using is canola oil. Works really good. There's lots of different oils you can use. A lot of people ask why not motor oil, like use motor oil. Honestly, other than the smell, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I know that, that canola oil works well, that a lot of uh, vegetable-based oils, peanut oil works well. My kids have peanut allergies, so I can't use that. But uh, it has to do with the viscosity and I don't know. 
Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not like an expert in this stuff, but I would I would think that motor oil would smell quite bad. At least this way, when you when you quench in canola oil, it just smells like you're making French fries in your garage. Who doesn't love French fries? All right, well that sucker cooled off real quick. So let's see if it is hard. And the way we're going to check that is with our favorite tool in this project, a file. If everything has gone properly, we should not be able to file this edge. This should be, ooh, it feels, it feels like it's hard. Let's see what we got. Oh yes, that is not fun. That is skating right over there. So we've hardened it. We have definitely hardened uh, this cutting edge. So the next step of the process is to temper the blade. Right now it is super, super hot, but it's also very fragile. If I were to take this and just bang it on a piece of steel, there's, there's a high likelihood it could just shatter. It's like glass right now. Uh, so we want to kind of temper it up. For this, I'm just going to use 400 degrees and I'm going to do one temper cycle uh, for about a half an hour. And that should soften it up to the point where it's not quite as fragile. Again, with such a fine tip that we have on here, if you were to drop this on the concrete, tip down, chances are you'd bust that tip off anyway even if it was properly tempered. But we're gonna go ahead and throw it in the oven for half an hour at 400 degrees and uh, see how it looks then. All right, so we've taken it out of our temper. Not a huge issue with warping. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm just gonna clamp in the vise and then we will take some sandpaper, clean up this bevel a little bit. And uh, when I sand it down, I'll sand it. I'm just going to dip it in the ferric chloride just to see if by chance we got a hamon on there. So let's clean this up real quick. Alright, so we've taken up to 400 and I think I see a hamon line there. I'm not entirely sure, but I believe. So let's dip it in the ferric chloride. Yes. We definitely have a hamon line. Alright, we're just about done with the ferric chloride. Check it out. We got a little bit of hail coming down. Good old storm. Anyways, let's go ahead and pull this out of the ferric chloride. It's been in there for eight minutes. We'll see if this is a, if we got a deeper etch on there or not. I'm hoping that this uh, 2000 grit will leave some of that. If not, I'll have to do a little more, a little more investigating to figure out how to get those hormones to really pop. The other thing with hamones that I, I do know, I've done a little bit of looking into them, I know a lot of steels will hamone better than other steels. Hmm. I mean, it's kind of cool, but it also looks just unfinished. And it looks like this, this part kind of is a lot more pitted, and it just looks, looks like we put a crappy finish on there, so... I'm going back to 400, and then we'll probably do 400, 600, and I might just forget that hormone. It's always fun just to experiment. And it is a visible line still. Like I said, uh, this actually is just, I've never had a desire to dry a hormone before. And I just kind of thought of it while I was doing this, and I was like, you know what, let's give it a shot. But it's piqued my interest enough that I definitely want to look into these a little bit more. You know, that's kind of the one thing with knife making is that there's so many different areas of it. So many different techniques, different ways of getting it done that, you know, you kind of start with, with what attracts you. Um, I mean, stock removal is obviously my way of making blades. I definitely want to get into forging, but I got into stock removal and when you start to see results, like even with this project, this is purely stock removal, when you can see that you're actually making something useful. That's when it gets really exciting. And so I, I think, you know, a lot of people, I think if you start with stock removal, that's probably why they stay with it for a while. Because it's exciting and, and you're doing it. And it's like, wow, I'm making a knife. This is so cool. And it's not to say I don't want to, or you don't ever want to go on to forging, because I certainly want to go into forging, but this is just the way that I got into it. It's probably an easier way to get into it. 
and there's a lot of stuff that comes with forging um you know you can our power's out power just went out all right we've got the power back and we pretty much got it to a nice mirror polish and just to finish this up uh, so basically the steps we went 220 400 600 and then i went from that straight to 2000 might not be the right way whatever and then i've got a piece of this is just g10 with a piece of leather glued to it and just so i can get a nice even consistent finish when you get to the really fine finishes you know when you're going back and forth and you're changing directions like that you really see those little stop marks and so you can either just continually pass if you had a bigger blade you just you kind of start and do can just straight passes instead of going back and forth back and forth you just kind of drag it and lift it up and drag it again uh, but what i'm going to do is just put it on here and this should just give us some really nice even even finish hand hand polished mirror finish hopefully okay we're gonna call that pretty good you can still see that line there what I think is our home line. line not entirely sure but we're gonna call that finished good right there the only real thing left for this is uh, we'll kind of sand up these edges here I might hit a little sandpaper on here just to kind of bring a little bit of color into it and then after that we'll put an edge on it all right, so I have an idea as to how I'm going to try and sharpen it. I'm gonna try sharpening with sandpaper. I don't know if that's gonna work. It might, but it's worth a try. Uh, that way we can just kind of keep it as a real, as, as easy project. You know, you might not have fancy sharpening stuff or even sharpening stones. So I'm gonna see if we can just sharpen it with sandpaper, but I have to take Henry inside. You don't like it out here, do you, Henry? No. I'm gonna put Henry inside. He's too scared out in the garage. We'll see if we can sharpen this knife. Now I'm gonna start on this side here. And I'm really, I'm not putting much of an angle on here because this is technically the non-beveled edge. So I'm barely holding it at an angle just so we can hit that edge. But I don't really want to come up like this with it. I'm talking like I know what I'm doing. Never done this before. I don't know, I'm just going to kind of guesstimate an angle. I think it's actually working. It is working. What I'm doing is I'm using my fingers as a stop against this granite surface plate. Really anything that you have that's really flat and hard and isn't gonna give much deflection you could use for this. Well, we're actually putting a burr on this side. So that's cool. Let's go to 400. And again, when I do it this side, I'm actually using my fingers as a rest. So I'm not sure if I can show you that, but my fingers are underneath the blade here and that's kind of keeping this height and then I'm just tilting this down accordingly. Hmm, I like it. Okay, now for some 800. All right, so this is actually the next day and while I was just finishing the sharpening there, um, we had our basement had a little bit of flooding and it, it wasn't anything major. Uh, essentially, we've got this, this conduit pipe where like the lines come from our well into the basement and just with the settling of all the dirt we've moved, we had a sinkhole outside and that sinkhole happened right where the end of the conduit kind of stubbed out kind of... I don't know, about 15 feet away from our house and it just, just by freak, by fluke, uh, the water was going into there and then it's coming up through that conduit pipe into the basement and so it'll all be fixed once we get our grading done. So I'm, I'm thinking next week in my project is gonna be a whole bunch of bobcat work, gotta bring in a bunch of fill, regrade everything because it's all settled over the winter time. Uh, but that's why I was like getting this video done. I apologize, I was like getting ready to edit and getting all the footage together and then the kids are like, dad, there's water in the basement. So I had to deal with that. But let's take a look at how the knife turned out. So here it is. I'm really happy with the way this has turned out. Uh, you can kind of see our line there. I'm not sure if that is really a hamon or not. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. But you see we did get a nice secondary bevel on there just using sandpaper. And then I also put one on this side. And the biggest reason is that before I had done this side, 
it was a little bit toothy just because of the fact of you know this material was had high spots and low spots so i ended up beveling that down so we could get right to the main meat of the material so we could have a nice flat edge let's see if this cuts paper oh yeah i'm really happy with that It's not flawless or anything like that. And it cuts leather. Now, the way I plan on using this to cut leather is like this. Oh, I don't want to cut through my table like I just did. Whoops. Pretty happy with the way that that is. And so we took some sandpaper, kind of brought back some of that finish back, the texturing on the file. And again, you could do all kinds of stuff. You know, you could heat this up and hammer mark it. It would look really cool. Uh, I didn't get too crazy here on these parts, but, um, I'm really, really kind of impressed with the way this turned out. And that is literally how easy it can be to get into knife making. You know, the reason that I wanted to start with a small project as a build along is just for those that have never built a knife before and they're wondering like how hard it is it to do. And, and that's also the reason why I chose not to use any hand tools. Um, really, there's only a few hours of work that goes into something like this. And if you don't have power tools, or well, you've got some files, this is totally a doable project. And obviously, I mean, the results speak for themselves. This is a good usable knife. This is a knife you can use for all sorts of different things and whatever variation, but this right here is how I got into knife making, is, is making a knife with files, uh, doing it all by hand, and it was after I made a few of these that I ended up building my first belt grinder, but I just want to do this project to show that, you know what, it's really quite simple. A little bit of sweat equity into it, uh, a few hours of manual labor, boom, you've got yourself a great usable tool. It's really awesome seeing what you guys are doing on, on the social media with the hashtag SLL build along keep those coming in that is really sweet and then you know I've had a lot of questions uh, here on YouTube as well as like on Instagram and stuff people are saying well if I have an angle grinder should I just use that and I, I'd say yes I mean really we're not trying to make things difficult for ourselves the reason that I chose to do this is because I just want to share and show that it is possible so at the end of a few hours of work we've got ourselves a usable cure dashi anyways guys we're gonna wrap this little build project up right here we'll maybe dream up something for next month possibly we'll get into uh, maybe some scale Look at some very, uh, very simple, kind of go back to the simple ways that you can make a knife, maybe a larger blade with some scales and different types of handle options that are great places to start when you're getting into knife making. But thanks so much for watching, guys. Thank you to all who have built along with this. It is really cool. It's fun to be a part of this, and I'm very grateful that you've taken part. So thanks for watching, guys. Cheers.